Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου σα καλωσορίζει στη δεύτερη ετήσια διάλεξη υπερίων που διοργανώνεται με την ευγενή προσφορά τη εταιρεία Hyperion Systems Engineering. Ο εισηγητή τη δεύτερη ετήσια διάλεξη, κ. Ανδρέα Κραμπή, πρόεδρο και εκτελεστικό διευθυντή τη Honeywell Performance Materials and Technologies, θα αναπτύξει το θέμα Steering through the storm from weakness to strength, one decision week at a time. Μετά την παρουσίαση του κ. Κραμπή, θα ακολουθήσει συζήτηση. Τη συζήτηση θα συντονίσουν ο δόκτωρ Σιμεών Κασιανίδη, πρόεδρο και διευθύνων σύμβουλο τη Hyperion Systems Engineering Limited, και ο κ. Σταύρο Πανό, εκτελεστικό αντιπρόεδρο τη Υπερίων. Στο σημείο αυτό, καλείται ο πρίτανη του Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου, καθηγητή Κωνσταντίνο Χριστοφίδη, να προσέλθει στο βήμα για να χαιρετήσει την εκδήλωση. Κύριε Πρίτανη. Καλησπέρα σα. Κύριοι εκπρόσωποι των πολιτικών κομμάτων, έντιμε κύριε Υπουργέ, κύριε Κασιανίδη, κύριε Κραμβή, αγαπητέ και αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, εκλεκτοί προσκεκλημένοι, αγαπητέ φοιτήτρε και αγαπητοί φοιτητέ, με ιδιαίτερη χαρά σα καλωσορίζω στην ετήσια διάλεξη υπερίων. Πρόκειται για τη δεύτερη διάλεξη που πραγματοποιείται σε συνεργασία και με τη στήριξη τη Υπερίων Systems Engineering. Επιτρέψτε μου να εκφράσω τι θερμέ ευχαριστίε μα προ τον όμιλο και τον διευθύνοντα σύμβολο τη Υπερίων, κ. Σιμεό Κασιανίδη, για την εμπιστοσύνη και την ανιδιοτελή προσφορά του στο Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου και του ανθρώπου μα. Ο όμιλο, πέρα από τη συμβολή του στην πραγματοποίηση τη απόψηνή διάλεξη, παραχωρεί δύο ετήσια βραβεία αριστεία σε φοιτητέ μα, από τμήματα συναφού αντικειμένου με τι δραστηριότητέ του προσφέροντάς του συνάμα και πλήρη εργοδότηση. Πρόκειται για μια πολύτιμη δωρεά που επικεντρώνεται στο ταλέντο και τις δεξιότητες των νέων παιδιών. Η επιβράβευση των φοιητών μας από την υπερίον αποτελεί έμπρακτη αναγνώριση των δυνατοτήτων τους. Φανερώνει παράλληλα την εμπιστοσύνη του ομίλου στο εκπαιδευτικό και ερευνητικό έργο που επιτελούμε. Σήμερα έχουμε τη χαρά και την τιμή να φιλοξενούμε τον κύριο Ανδρέα Κραμβή. Χαιρόμαστε ιδιαίτερα για την παρουσία σα στο Ίδρυμά μα. Κύπροι που διαπρέπουν στο εξωτερικό αποδεικνύουν με τον καλύτερο τρόπο ότι το μέγεθο μια χώρα εξαρτάται από την ποιότητα και την αποφασιστικότητα των ανθρώπων τη. Για να ξεπεράσουμε τι δύσκολε οικονομικέ συγκυρίε, πρέπει να ακούμε με προσοχή ανθρώπου που τόλμησαν, αναδιοργάνωσαν και μετασχημάτισαν τι επιχειρήσει του για να αντεπεξέλθουν επιτυχώ στι συνεχώ μεταβαλλόμενε συνθήκε. Σήμερα. Στην κατάλληλη στιγμή, φιλοξενούμε το κατάλληλο πρόσωπο για να μα μεταδώσει τι συμβουλέ και τι δικέ του εμπειρίε. Ο κόσμο μα αλλάζει ραγδαία. Οι κυπριακέ επιχειρήσει και οι νέοι επιχειρηματίε καλούνται να δημιουργήσουν υπεραξία εν μέσω οικονομική κρίση. Καθένα από εμά καλείται να προσφέρει υπηρεσίε και προϊόντα με λιγότερου οικονομικού πόρου, με περισσότερη όμω αποδοτικότητα, εφευρετικότητα και επινοητικότητα. Πρέπει να ενεργούμε στοχαζόμενοι τις προοπτικές και σκεπτόμενοι τις τάσεις του μέλλοντος και όχι τις τάσεις του παρόντος. Να αρπάζουμε τις ευκαιρίες που παρουσιάζονται, που παρουσιάζονται και συνάμα να δημιουργούμε καινούριε. Το Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου έχει να επιτελέσει ουσιαστικό ρόλο προς αυτήν την κατεύθυνση. Αποτελεί την ατμομηχανή της ερευνητική ανάπτυξης του, του τόπου με τα περισσότερα με διαφορά τα περισσότερα ευρωπαϊκά και διεθνή προγράμματα. Από τον καιρό τη ίδρυσή του, το Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου έλαβε από την πολιτεία 932 εκατομμύρια ευρώ και δημιούργησε στο σύνολό του άλλα 278 εκατομμύρια από ίδια έσοδα. Το ποσοστό εξωτερική χρηματοδότηση σε σχέση με την κρατική χορηγία ήταν το 2000 στο 11%. Το 2010 αυξήθηκε στο 28%, ενώ την τελευταία τριετία εκτοξεύτηκε στο 46%. Επίσης, κάτι που ίσως πολλοί από εσά δεν γνωρίζετε, είναι ότι η πατρίδα μας συμμετέχει στις διεθνείς επιστημονικές συζητήσεις κατά μεγάλο βαθμό μέσω του Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου. Το 68% των άνθρων από την Κύπρο που εμφανίζονται στα διεθνή επιστημονικά περιοδικά προέρχονται από το Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου καθώς και το 63% των διεθνών αναφορών για την επιστημονική δραστηριότητα στην Κύπρο αφορούν την έρευνα που γίνεται στο Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου. Είμαστε η επιστημονική αναφορά της πατρίδας μας. Κυρίες και κύριοι, 
Η διαφοροποίηση είναι η λέξη κλειδί για τι επιχειρήσει του σήμερα. Οι συνέργειε πανεπιστημίων και επιχειρήσεων μπορούν να συμβάλλουν ουσιαστικά στην παροχή υπηρεσιών και προϊόντων που θα βελτιώσουν την ποιότητα τη ζωή μα. Σε αυτέ τι συνεργασίε πρέπει να εστιάσουμε για να βελτιώσουμε υφιστάμενα προϊόντα και να εφεύρουμε καινούργια. Τέτοιε συνέργειε μπορούν να δημιουργήσουν νέε θέσει εργασία, να συνεισφέρουν στην οικονομική και κοινωνική ανάπτυξη τη χώρα και να δώσουν ευκαιρίε στα νέα παιδιά να εφαρμόσουν τι δικέ του μοναδικέ ιδέε. Η πρόκληση σήμερα είναι η όσμωση των επιστημών και των επιστημόνων. Η συνεργασία του με τέτοιο τρόπο ώστε να παρέχουν ένα αναβαθμισμένο προϊόν, μια πρωτοποριακή υπηρεσία που να προσφέρει μια μοναδική εμπειρία, αναγκαία και ωφέλιμη για την κοινωνία. Απευθύνομαι στου νέου ανθρώπου και στου φοιτητέ μα. Χρησιμοποιήστε σωστά αυτά που σα διδάσκουν οι δάσκαλοι σα. Σκεφτείτε επιχειρηματικά και πρωτότυπα. Εφαρμόστε στην πράξη και εναλλακτικά έξω από συμβάσει όσα αποκομίσετε από το Πανεπιστήμιο. Δημιουργήστε κάτι καινούριο, κάτι πρωτόγνωρο, κάτι πρωτότυπο. Είμαι σίγουρο ότι ο φίλο μου Σιμεών Κασιανίδη αυτά είχε στο μυαλό του όταν πριν από 20 χρόνια ίδρυε την Υπερίο. Σε μια άλλη εποχή, με πολλού περιορισμού, ενέργησε έξω από συμβατικά πλαίσια και δημιούργησε κάτι καινούριο. Γι' αυτό και πέτυχε. Σα ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστούμε, κύριε Πρίτανη. Καλείται στο βήμα ο δόκτωρ Σιμεών Κασιανίδη, πρόεδρο και διευθύνων σύμβουλο τη Hyperion Systems Engineering Limited, για να χαιρετήσει τη δεύτερη ετήσια διάλεξη περίων και να παρουσιάσει τον απόψινο μιλητή. Κύριε Κασιανίδη, ο λόγο σε εσά. Ξέρετε, με κύριε Υπουργέ, εκπρόσωποι τη κοινοβουλευτική ομάδα τη Κύπρου. Ε, αγαπητοί φίλοι, αγαπητοί συναδέλφοι, σας α, χαίρομαι πολύ να σας, α, να, σας προσ... να σας βλέπω σήμερα εδώ στη, στη δεύτερη ετήσια ε, ε, ομιλία της Υπερίων. Θα γυρίσω τώρα στα αγγλικά. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here uh, this evening for the second annual Hyperion Lecture. For those of you wondering who Hyperion is, and I've had a number of questions this evening saying, you know, what do you do, uh, what is your activity, and so forth. We're an engineering technology advisory consulting uh, and uh, implementation of advanced software and technology to the process industries. That is oil and gas, chemicals, petrochemicals, uh, steel and aluminum. And we work with, uh, as you may have seen, noticed in the original, in the small video, with the largest companies around the world. We have a global presence. We have 10 subsidiaries in 10, in 10 countries. And today, there were Hyperion people executing work in Brazil, in, uh, in the United States, in, in Europe, in Saudi Arabia, in India, in Russia, and so forth. So, now to the lecture, 2013 for us, as the uh, director uh, mentioned before, was our 20th anniversary of starting a company from, uh, from the very, very, when, it, when the whole thing started, it was one person. And uh, today we're about 200 people in 10, uh, in 10 countries. So what we have here is uh, we started uh, working with the university. We had uh, our first very successful lecture last year. And we are continuing this tradition, which we hope is going to continue on for a very, very long time. In this uh, second lecture, I have the great honor to introduce Mr. Andreas Kramvis. Andreas is uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Honeywell Performance Materials and Technologies since 2008. Performance Materials and Technologies is one of uh, Honeywell's four strategic business groups with sales of more than $7 billion, annual sales, and serious profitability. Andreas is also the author of an extremely useful and relevant book titled Transforming the Corporation, Running a Business in the 21st Century. In his book, uh, he demonstrates his method for systematically transforming a business for high performance. I've had, I can say I've had the pleasure of reading the book, and it's, it can work as a primer. So. 
uh, a lot of the points of uh, his teachings have uh, direct relevance and uh, applications to our current environment in Cyprus. And uh, I will close uh, by thanking Andreas for accepting our invitation to be with us tonight and thanking you all for coming. So, Andreas, please. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, uh, Simeon, for that introduction. And uh, Rector, I'm extremely impressed by uh, uh, what this university has achieved in the last, I think, 22 years. Uh, when I grew up here in Nicosia, just a couple of miles from here, uh, there's absolutely no university, uh, let alone an institution which is gaining uh, recognition around the world. And indeed, this afternoon, I visited the photovoltaic center because my own company, uh, two years ago, I started doing research from the United States uh, using the photovoltaic center. And I have to say, this research isn't done because I am from Cyprus. It's because they're good enough and very good. So I think this is a, a terrific place to be. And uh, at the same time, uh, a few months ago, I was uh, talking to Simeon, who himself has uh, uh, achieved something remarkable with Cyprus as a base, an international business selling services. Uh, around the globe uh, in a very effective way, and I know that uh, because we interact in our businesses. And uh, I think 100% of his sales or near thereabouts are outside Cyprus. So I think that's a, a very a major achievement. Now, my own experience uh, has been uh, really in uh, turning companies around in various industries. And uh, of course, in a turn or in a, if you're turning something around, it's like a pressure cooker, and it's not very dissimilar. In fact, it's exactly the same to what happens when um, the wheels of the economic condition uh, break down and the economies kind of do the kind of things that have happened in, uh, in, uh, in Cyprus. And uh, they haven't only happened in Cyprus, uh, they've happened in uh, many parts of the world. So uh, just putting everything together, let me start um, with a couple of introductions, uh, introductory slides to show you where I'm starting from. But uh, to my mind, uh, management is management, uh, whether it's here, whether it's somewhere else, uh, whether it's for a large company, whether it's for a small company, I think the approaches you have to use are the same. Uh, I happen to work in a very large company, but there is no such thing as a large company. You always win. Uh, uh, in customers one at a time, and it's only always it's an employee at a time. And we do uh, $39 billion uh, and uh, employ 132,000 people. Now, that's a big number of people. Uh, that forces you to think how you manage. Uh, in my own business, uh, which is in fundamental uh, performance uh, materials, uh, I, I do sales of about seven billion, but we're very fundamental to a lot of things that are happening around the world. And we're like the university here, we're very technology driven. Uh, and uh, we provide the basis for about 60% of the world's gasoline and diesel, wherever you are in the world, uh, uh, more than uh, two thirds of the world's uh, polyester, uh, basis of technology, the refrigerants you use, uh, in air conditioning, and a number of other areas. So uh, we were a very serious uh, research uh, company. Now, what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, doesn't have to do with research, although research is one of the contributory factors, but it's how you take a company uh, and really turn it around and make a terrific performance. Uh, what you see here is a slide of actual performance uh, of how my business has performed uh, going back to 2005. You see that's the red line, the red line at the top. We were where the competition was. And the competition in, uh, in uh, green and, 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 and blue is similar companies uh, on the New York Stock Exchange doing similar kind of things that we are doing. And then what happened was that uh, our performance took off uh, using some of the techniques I'm going to discuss tonight. And the interesting thing is when the recession happened uh, in the US, and of course, uh, a lot of people are uh, 
blaming the United States for causing all the economic, uh, all the economic ills of the world, and uh, it's probably correct. Uh, I certainly am not going to deny that a lot of the economic problems started in, uh, in, in the U.S. Of course, other places, uh, including Cyprus, helped themselves to the, uh, to the, to the problems also. And, uh, but uh, the key point here is, uh, if you are in the right position in a company, even through the most monumental recession, uh, certainly uh, in our company since the recession of uh, 1930, uh, we increased our profitability. And uh, everybody else uh, really had a problem. And these are very major companies selling hundreds of billions of dollars in the kind of green and the blue line. Uh, they run into trouble. So the question arises, what did you do different? What is it that you do? Uh, is there some learnings here that uh, we can take and transfer to uh, other parts of the world or uh, in the way we run businesses? And I'm going to start with a couple of uh, abstracting, taking a, a couple of ideas, taking things um, away from, uh, from specific industries or the business you're doing. But the reality is when things are going well, and we know in Cyprus things went well, and in the US things went well, and around the world things can go very well, everyone gets very excited. But good companies uh, don't get overexcited and keep their eye on some very key factors. That is the ability to grow with the economy, grow above the economy, but not get overstretched themselves. Uh, they make sure that they have pricing power. If you lose pricing power in a lot of areas, it's an indication that you're losing competitiveness. And certainly stay focused on cost control and ability to change direction as conditions change, a continuous change. Now, at the same time, on the right, a badly positioned company will do these things, but not very well. But because the market is growing, because money is cheap, because money is plentiful, because everybody's expanding, uh, you don't realize you're not in a good position. Guess what happens? Something bad happens, like the very major recession we had in the United States or the uh, situation in Cyprus, and then you find how good you are. Uh, in fact, if you're not well positioned, uh, what the, the options you have are very limited because you are not prepared how to react. Your processes, your people, the way you run the business, the systems you have, the thinking, are, do not put you in a competitive position. And in reality, you kind of pull your hair out and say, well, what am I going to do? I just got to cut costs and see if I can make it. It's not the only way forward. If you're more prepared, you reallocate, you put uh, emphasis on things that are going to help you later. And this really is what uh, I'm going to be expanding over the next 20 minutes uh, in, in, this, uh, in this discussion here, in this presentation. One item that's very important uh, is that, again, in good times, uh, we tend to lose the notion of what productivity is. And uh, in uh, a lot of the things we're doing, uh, for instance, we take risks that we shouldn't. Uh, we're not prudent. We had sales before. We, uh, we had, say, we in our case, we had sales before we are adding people. We are very prudent because we think things may go wrong. Uh, we forget about operating efficiently. And operating efficiently means you learn how to do more with less. You learn how to do new things with what you have. Uh, and do not lose sight that your ratios and your numbers have to be improving, especially if the times are good. Because if you are getting bloated when the times are good, when things turn back, obviously you're not going to be uh, in a great position. Uh, you need to be very careful about procurement uh, and utilization rates. So these are some very big ideas that you just cannot be traveling in hope or in uh, that things are always going to be great. Uh, you have to be prepared and be tight enough. And I have here some interesting examples to give you what uh, tight enough is. I don't expect you to look at all these numbers. I just want to concentrate on a, uh, just simply on a couple of numbers. Um, I have here a situation of a company that uh, does sales in year one of 100 euros, dollars, whatever you like. And of course, the market in 
good old days used to grow 3% uh, GDP. Let's say you grow with that GDP. If you let all your costs do the same thing, um, you obviously are going to get your income growth, the bottom line, the profit, uh, by 3%. And for many people, this is, yeah, it's great, isn't it? We're up 3%. Well, I can tell you if you're in your New York Stock Exchange, this is a terrible performance. Um, because if you're getting 3% top line, you need to be tight enough to be running something better and also be doing other things to grow above market. And this is the second example I have. From the same market situation, if you're able to uh, keep your costs in line, uh, if you're able to grow above market, you can easily get 12%. And that is considered a great performance. And on the other hand, you can do even better if you get your procurement costs. You can go to 17%. These are big numbers. But let me take the opposite here, which is the last example I have, uh, which is very simple, that says, okay, market's growing 3%. I'm not competitive. I lose on price. I let my, let my costs go up. And guess what? Uh, I am at minus seven, year on year. Now, this is in good times. Well, what is going to happen when the market contracts by 5%? This company will lose a lot of money because it's not in a position to operate. And um, I just gave you these examples to see the range you can easily find yourself when you lose that top line and your, your costs uh, are going, uh, and your operating uh, costs are going the wrong way, and you lose the ability to grow in the marketplace. So uh, I run a big business. It's an extremely profitable business. But I can tell you every day I am concerned what would happen if this bad thing happened or that bad, bad thing happened, and how prepared are we to react. And the item that uh, the systematic solution I found to this problem is what I have published my book about and is finding a, a fair amount of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a number of people are getting excited about some of these ideas. And this is how do you transform a company. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people in this room who are used to looking at numbers and they say, okay, you look at the numbers, you change the ratios. Well, that's not the answer. That is the result. You look at the numbers after you've done the things you have to do. Uh, what you have to do at the beginning is understand that you need the ideas and the methodology to change what you're doing every day, to change your orientation to the marketplace, to take those people you have, change the way they think, and put them in a system that you can run a company without having supermen and superwomen but they get up every morning, come to work, and effortlessly bring a very good result. So it means you have to change everything. And of course, who is going to do it? If you're running the business, it's your responsibility to do it. So let me just tell you the methodology I use for effecting this transformation, uh, or what I call a change. So uh, when I put this slide up, and I've given this presentation at a number of, uh, of uh, meetings and universities, uh, people have a bit of a shock. Because uh, what is on top of that is something that says, I run my business 20% of the time, using 20% of my time. So uh, that is kind of revolutionary. And in fact, uh, I'm here in Cyprus uh, after a very long trip kind of uh, from the Far East to here and back to the United States. So I've been away from my office for three weeks. And I'm not concerned about what is happening. But why do we do that? Why uh, is somebody doing that? Well, it is important to understand that many of the solutions that you have to do in a business do not lie within the business. Do not lie at looking at those numbers all days and having the same discussions. They lie in understanding the marketplace, in developing business, in de understanding what you have to do tomorrow. Most of the solution of your problems is outside your walls than inside your walls. What you do in that 20% of the time, you use it very effectively. You coordinate everybody. You create like a dance, a choreography that everybody knows has to be there. Certainly the guys who work for me know they have to be there. There's no excuse. They know it from the beginning of the year, 10 months in the year, 10 that those 10 weeks they have to be around. 
where we will discuss in a very systematic way uh, how we're going to run the business, what are our programs, how we're going to educate people, how we increase our capability, how we roll out uh, and roll out new, new initiatives so that uh, we are becoming stronger and stronger. We are taking care of opportunities and we have a systematic method of running, in this case, a very complex multi-technology $7 billion business. And believe you me, those 10 weeks are enough. Then you go do and you come back and review and start again. And uh, that makes for a very effective way of going forward, which is why I have it at the center of, of, of my model, uh, in red, like a gear, uh, which shows um, how, how things operate. A couple of other ideas, um, and uh, I'll be very pleased if uh, all of you who are running businesses together out of this uh, half an hour of presentation get one or two ideas. That's probably too much uh, to, to discuss one in, in one evening. Uh, a, a, a very, very important idea, and I think it's, it's, it's very uh, relevant to what's happening in Cyprus. It certainly has been relevant in any of the businesses I've turned around. And uh, every time I go to business in trouble, the employees say to me, um, how much money have you brought with you? Because we need to invest in this. We are behind in that. We need new resources. We need to do new things. Well, the answer is, I brought zero. And I think when I hear second-hand information, I haven't got to the banks in Cyprus. If you go to the banks now, the answer is also zero. And uh, so what do you do? Uh, I've been in the zero position a number of times. And uh, what you have to do is to rethink your business. You have to reallocate. You have to understand what has a future and what is no longer relevant. You have to assess things like your business model, how the business operates, and then you have to place bets. So you contract one piece to fund the pieces that you need to keep. It's a complex process, but you have to be decisive because if you postpone it, it gets worse, especially if you don't have money, especially if you're in a loss-making position, you have to be very decisive. Um, another area that I call that Free, free money. What can be more free in a management situation? What can be more free than making the right decisions? Making the right decisions all the time and getting them right first time so you don't have rework, you don't have screw-ups. I know a number of you here have been to, to business school and uh, they've learned about decision-making under uncertainty. And frankly, I have respect for that, but I don't think it's enough to run a business. I think there's more behavioral matters that determine how successful you are. Uh, one of the things that uh, I observe in companies that are failing is that there is an openness and trust between the people who run it. They're quarreling amongst themselves. So you've got to put that right. You've got to say, guys, we have to work here on an economic grounds only. And, um, you know, those who don't like those rules certainly can leave. But if you work economically, let's be open find solutions, implement, and we can discuss anything we want, but once a decision is made, a decision is made. So at the same time as you have the openness, you allow people to come about and really talk uh, and learn and, uh, and put forward their ideas, but at some point you've got to cut it up, cut it off, and move forward. Uh, there is no successful company, to my mind, without the third or fourth point I have in this presentation. And this point kind of dovetails with my idea of running 20% of the, a business of 20% of the time. What is forward thinking? So you go in a company that's failing and you ask the question, how are we doing? And they're telling you six months ago we did this, three months ago we did that, two months ago, we don't know how the month did, but, but you know, that's where we are. You say, are these guys on top of the game? Not where I am. A company that's successful, they say, well, we're doing okay. This is what we're going to do tomorrow. This is exactly where we're going to be in six months. Management is not about the past. Management is about the future. So it's very important to understand how you will shape that future as opposed to let that future shape you. And this is the basis of my management philosophy and system 
to turn an organization from looking at items that happened yesterday in firefighting to a very small part of our thinking time and our doing time. So you go in a business that's not doing well, your first decision week is going to be tough. You're trying to understand what's going on, and you're talking about the past, maybe 80% of the time. But I guarantee you in a year's time, it's only 20%. 20 percent of the 20 percent you talk about the past. In three years' time, I now run a seven billion dollar business with very standardized Doran information. And uh, we're talking maybe three hours about what happened last month. The rest of the time is, what are we going to do? How are we going to shape uh, the marketplace? And I have an example here. Just look at the red and green. It's just uh, it's not something you can read from where you are. But it's an example of the simplicity of standardizing your information. My company produces 42 of these daily. Why do we do that? Well, it's clear. This is about a very large plant, and it's clear how it performed in the day. Our metrics are, uh, we all speak the same language, whether we're in China, whether we're in South America, whether we're in North America. Uh, we understand immediately what we're doing. And that means we're not spending any time arguing what the facts are or politicizing the facts. It's action-driven. It saves time. It moves forward. So you do all those things. And what else do you do? Risk is something that, again, I know gets taught. Uh, not meaning to be negative about business education. Um, I gained a lot from my MBA. But sometimes it just misses the real important things. Uh, it's nice to know the beta of an investment. It's nice to know the DCF to the fourth decimal point. Uh, but the reality is the risk in, in any business is the risk that arises from very simple things that are not systematized. Simple doesn't mean easy. Simple to do every day is very difficult. So what are the simple things that you need to do every day? Well, common language. Do we, do we really mean the same things when we say something is, uh, you know, uh, this is a variable cost? Do we have the same definitions? Are we communicating or are we just talking like that? Uh, how rigorous is our decision making? Uh, do we have a robust way of looking at everything? Do we know if things are going wrong? How quickly? Are we set up to do something about it? Do we have a good operating mechanism? Do we understand our markets in depth? Do we grasp technology? So what I'm really saying is, there's, what is risk? Well, there's a certain risk you have to take because it's going to happen in the economy, it's going to happen in, in, in competitive situations. But there's a lot of internal risk that you're generating as a manager and I am generating myself by not being rigorous enough in the daily running of a business. To the extent you're able to eliminate this, you clearly will improve your chances uh, and your effectiveness in a big way. And then you go to be upfront. If you have areas of weakness, face them. Do something about it. Fix, fix the fundamentals. I don't walk away from them. Uh, if you see areas that are potential accidents, well, yeah, let's move ahead and avoid the accident. Uh, so it's, you have to be proactive and reduce the risk of what you're doing. Um, at the same time as you're being, really, you're generating a very robust operating system. You have to be quick enough to grab, grasp opportunities. And the two appear to be opposite. Um, and I find difficulties in, in life quite often, you, you look at things. I have to do this, I have no money. Uh, I have to be conservative, but I have to be aggressive. Uh, it, it, Quite frequently, life is about learning and being successful. It's about learning how to reconcile those two opposite positions. And this is the opposite of running a low-risk operation. Because if you do have a low-risk operation, you are the first guy who is going to be able to look at your possibilities of making uh, new opportunities. And you're going to be the first person who will be able to, uh, to grasp them. And I train my, 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 my business leadership to really be on the lookout for opportunities, and I have a whole litany here, I don't have the time to go through it, to recognize, verify, 
move ahead, be quick about them. And at the same time, you need to recognize situations that can be catastrophic. And there are situations in the global environment, either from regulation, either from competition, that if you don't react to and see early enough, uh, they will be catastrophic. Now, what I'm really talking about is on this aggressive side of the business, is how you obtain competitive advantage. And uh, there are many ways of obtaining competitive advantage. In my business, because we've got terrific technology, we create new markets through technology. But then there's other ways to do that. Uh, you can uh, deliver advantage from design, from delivery, the way you interact with customers. Who would have thought that Apple would become the, the most valuable company on, on this earth by just the user interface? Um, so, you know, it's, there's, in everything we do, there's ways, there's ways to obtain competitive advantage depending on the business, but you absolutely sh you should be seeking that out uh, because it's what guarantees welfare. Okay, I'll just, uh, you know, uh, I've talked so far about, um, about uh, a lot of things, and I never mentioned the, ones, the word strategy. I do think it's one of the most overused words in the, uh, in the management dictionary. Uh, on the other hand, what do, what do I, I think there's two or three basic things that one has to do in strategy. And to my mind, you know, there's a strategy of finance, there's a strategy of operations, but in reality, the king of strategies is how do you relate to the marketplace? So uh, that is basically what you need to work for. And one of the items I have here is how you optimize your business model. You know, what is a business model? Well, it's simply the mechanism by which you either lose customers or win customers. And if you look at what you do internally, um, are you aligned to be on the winning side as opposed to the losing side? And are your decision processes? say, you know, align to be able to service these markets? Are you responsive? Are you having the right decision points? So you need to change those pressure points to, to, to be responsive. And this is easy money. You can win doing that. The second item I want to mention is allocation of effort because most companies uh, allocate effort on what happened in the past. So, for instance, take an R&D budget. Let's say we're great at inventing catalysts, which is what my company does, a section of catalysts. And then the guys who know that area very well come and say, you know, we want another 10 million here. Okay, well, should we put it there or are we better off putting it in areas where we're not good enough and there's a much bigger opportunity? The same applies to sales. Uh, most frequently companies say this rep is that did 100 euros, there, and the other did 50, therefore the guy who did 100 has to do 10% more and the other has to do 5% more, and that's a fair allocation. I don't know if it's fair, I don't know what fair means. Fair means, what is the opportunity and what are you getting at? So you have to allocate, what is the opportunity of, of doing things in the future? So I'll just stop at those two areas, but there's a lot of techniques like that that are common sense, the only problem being that common sense is not common, and uh, Implementation is even harder, so you need the discipline after you believe in them uh, to implement them. So uh, I'll almost finish here on this slide, and I've got one more slide, uh, because I've very, you know, I, uh, I now run a, a, one of the most successful chemical companies in the world, and frankly, I, I'm not a chemist. I'm an electronics engineer. So, uh, as in other times in my career, I find myself walking into something, being responsible for something that I know nothing about. So, that's a, that's a kind of situation that uh, you need to look at the crystal ball. But I think as, uh, uh, as Winston Churchill said, uh, uh, in times of uh, ambiguity, unless if you have your principles worked out in advance, you're going to get lost. So, if you are the CEO, if you're running a business, you need principles. And those are what guide you when things are just not working well, or you're in the dark, and you don't know, and you don't have the benefit of experience. I just have six items here, which are flexible. Uh, I do them for my business. And I genuinely believe 
that is successful business has its roots in the marketplace. It's not in the vast resources we have, not in our plants, not in our investments. When I believe there's trouble coming, I don't go to my plants. I really go and visit customers. I go around the world. I believe this is where the, the business has to live. And I believe it genuinely. Strength in technology is essential. Whether you're an inventor of technology, which is what we are, or user of technology, I believe you can't afford to be behind. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to be productive. You're not going to be at the productivity end that you need to be. You need to empower people. Everybody on the payroll needs to be empowered. Now, I'm not advocating democracy. Running a business is not a democracy. Let's be sure about that. It's not a cacophony. It's not, but it's an ability to express your views and then line up with the decision in a very systematic way and feel you have to belong there. Whatever you do when you have operations, whether it's what uh, Simeon does and goes and uh, optimizes refineries in, in, in Saudi or wherever else, your operations have to be excellent. Or whatever I do, which is uh, produce chemicals and catalysts and processes, uh, you, have to be, you have to be the best there is. There's just no two ways about it. Um, you have to be number one. The next item is what I talked about. Management control. What's management control? Let's not confuse financial control with management control. Financial control is measurements. Management control is looking at the future and knowing where things are going, having plans for the future, uh, really feeling that you are the guy who is making the history as opposed to the other guys and you're getting dragged along and you don't know what's happening to you. Of course, we talked about risk and measuring the risk and balance. So in the dark, this is the light for me. If you're running a business, you need to have your own light and be sure about it, especially when things are not going well. Uh, if, at that point, it's too late to find the light. You better have it in advance. So, some uh, practical things, uh, just to close my, uh, my presentation here, uh, just summarizing the kind of issues I raised, and I know I covered a very, very wide field, and I don't expect anybody to remember other than a, one, a couple of points. Um, but if they're big enough, it's good enough. But let me just uh, uh, summarize here what I have, uh, which is importance of having a permanent operating mechanism. For my business, it's business decision week. Uh, for yours, it may be a business decision day or two decision days. But you need a systematic way of reviewing items to learn, to get better, to get the communications right to speed up, to look at the future. Very key through this process to have a common vocabulary. So what you used to take an hour to do, you should be able to take a half hour and it take about three minutes. Uh, because we are all communicating, we are all aligned, we are all doing things the right way. You've got to be demanding. Uh, you know, I don't think if you're at the top of an organization, you're doing the organization any favors to be nice to anybody. I don't mean to be rude, but we have to be demanding. We require improvement. You know why? If we don't improve, what's our competition doing? Well, they're going to improve even faster. Do we help anybody by taking that position? We do not. So we have to be reasonably demanding. We have to be demanding and updating our metrics and our expectations. At the same time, while you're demanding, you cannot suppress innovation. You must let it flourish. And when it's good, let it, let it, uh, you've got to find ways to do it. Even if the bank doesn't give you money, nobody gives you money, you've got to reallocate to let those good ideas to happen. And of course, recognize disruptive forces. What is really going to come is a big tsunami wave and hit you and prepare for it. And uh, uh, I think in most businesses, people generally, if they think back, uh, if they sit back, they, they'll work out uh, where the weaknesses are. So, uh, I think this brings me to, uh, to the end of my speech, uh, and uh, I think we have a, a Q&A session, and I'd uh, like to uh, uh, welcome uh, Simeon and Stavros to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone coming over. Uh, I hope you found this as exciting as I did. The floor is open for questions.
and uh, we will try to organize a conversational uh, approach to answering your questions. So, anyone, please. Yes, please. At the back. Thank you for the presentation. Um, basically, my question is with regards to the fact that you have identified as a critical success factor the ability to take measures and position a company during good times. How do you impose this discipline to your organization to think and act like that when times are good? I mean, this requires extreme discipline. How is this enforced? Yeah. I think it's a great question, and um, there's no shortcuts to it. Uh, you create the forum, you, and the forum in my case, guys, you have to come together. This is the way we're going to make decisions. This is our business decision week. This is the format. This is the topics we're going to discuss. And then through the, your behavior and your comments, you set expectations. The boss sets expectations. Um, and you basically uh, show your pleasure and this pleasure. Sometimes um, you, know, you never lose your temper because uh, that doesn't work, that doesn't get openness. But you guide people to begin to think differently. And my experience is that a lot of people see the value of this. There's a release in the organization. So immediately you get supporters to do that. Uh, you may find some guys who've been there for a long time uh, that just cannot cope with a fast-moving environment. Uh, and, you know, uh, you may have to think twice about those people. But generally, I find it's, it's a very small percentage. So it's got to be, as the, as, the, um, as, um, as the title of my lecture, it's this one decision we got at a time. It's a tough time. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a draining time if you're, if, you are, if you're the chair of the meeting. Uh, either in, in, in an industry or in a new situation, uh, you really have to work pretty hard to push the organization to think in a different way, in a nice way. Thank you. One want some comments? No, I think uh, it's very to the point. And, uh, I guess uh, we all try to put uh, systems in place and uh, prepare for the half times, I guess in Cyprus here, we were caught a little bit by surprise for uh, a number of people. Uh, but uh, we have to steer through the trouble, yes. and keep our heads uh, high, and try to manage with what we, we have. So. Any other question? I should point out that you can ask questions in Greek. As we have the metaphrase, Yeah, I um, like the idea of um, using the decision week as an operating mechanism for allocating capital, uh, focusing attention, the mind share, types of things that you mentioned in your book. So what would be the preconditions of making that work? I mean, for example, you mentioned during your lecture that having metrics using an evidence-based approach to decision-making is, is absolutely vital, because otherwise you have question marks around, okay, what is the evidence yeah. that supports a particular allocation, yeah? So that being one, uh, what are some of the other preconditions, Andrea, for making a decision week work? Yes. Apart from having proper metrics, having the evidence there, etc. Well, I, I think it's a great question. Um, it, you know, it depends on the starting point of the company. Uh, if you have a company that is simply kind of falling apart and discombobulated and people are fighting, um, the, the, the first few weeks you're trying to, to work this is to align people on their objectives, on their way, on their behaviors. What are the expectations are? And what are the metrics uh, that you're not going to get there on day one? For instance, I showed you that very complex matrix of red and green. Uh, it took us a year to get there because we had different people talking different way. Our systems were not the right way. 
So you need to persist to say, you know, this is a job that can be done in a minute and automated by computer, as opposed to us talking around, uh, sitting, talking about items that there should be no question about. So it's a determination of this is what it has to be at that level. Now, the other thing is you need to have the right processes that fit your business. Um, so what does, I can only talk about my business, what is a process that fits a business? It's going to be different from the business that Stavros and Simeon have. For instance, if you're developing software, you have certain stage gauges that you're going to, um, you're going to be uh, testing and you're going mm -hmm. to be commissioning and you're going to be validating. And you may want to gear your processes towards that from that point of view. In my case, a lot of my work has to do with uh, building, uh, inventing new molecules, then commercializing. So my processes have to do what we look at business decision week, is how we take this, how we build it up, how we verify it, verify the market, verify the investment, make the design. So you have to build the processes around what the business needs are uh, and not the other way around. It's not all processes work the same way. I'm trying to understand which are the KPIs that are important. So you need to have accurate data. And you'd go through a, a process of trying to identify and distill, let's say, which data is the important ones to flag the issues. And then when you find the issues, to go down to address those issues. Because I presume the, the template with the green, uh, yellow, and, and red is green you don't worry about. Yellow, if you have time, and red, you focus on. Exactly. You'll, and, it you'll took, behind. and it took you about a year to, yeah. to decide which information should be displayed. But it's beyond that. Uh, this applies to 42 different big plants. So, to be generic they, enough. They are, you know, are, the, are the guys using the information interpreting it the same way? Do we have the management and information systems to really produce the way in a consistent method? Uh, produce the information. So that's, yeah, it's a year's work. It's a lot of work. It may sound simple, but it's difficult. But once you do it, it saves, it saves a huge amount of time and moves you forward. So I guess to turn it into a little bit of a more practical. Huh? So here in Cyprus now, there's, uh, due to the circumstances, due to the tsunami, you used the word in your talk, uh, that has hit uh, most of us, uh, a number of businesses are now finding themselves of having to do a rapid response in a number of these different things. So the benefit of time, of having like a year or six months or five months or it's so forth, really is, is kind of not there. I mean, uh, you, you could argue, yes, they should have been better prepared. Uh, yes, they should have uh, been, uh, but then you would have people saying, yes, but the total absence of a financial uh, environment was never anticipated. So the coming into a practical and pragmatic look at mm -hmm. also the size of the businesses uh, here in Cyprus being significantly smaller, uh, what would you be, what would be like one or two key pointers or advice in terms of uh, uh, templatizing or yeah. focusing or actions that should be adopted as a first step that will give at least a breathing space before they yeah. develop more uh, formalized processes? Um, I think it's going to be reallocation. Uh, and uh, if you say, I'm going to look two years out, uh, how many of the things I used to do are going to be viable in the future? And I think what's happened in Cyprus, it's a, a tectonic move of, of, uh, of the marketplace and of the competitiveness and uh, of, of what you can do. And a lot of the things that we used to do are just not going to be any longer feasible. Uh, and it's a tough, tough, tough decision you've got to make because you, in many ways, especially in a family company, you've got to stop doing what your grandfather did. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's a very difficult emotional decision to bring yourself to, them to make. But, you know, uh, at the end of the day, um, it's, um, you're only an agent as a manager, and even if you're the owner and if it's your grandfather's business, uh, you're, you're an economic agent, and uh, I think you have to be decisive. 
So the reallocation to me is a major thing that needs to be done. I have a question. It's about reallocation and uh, and the human element. You said earlier that uh, the manager should decide which parts of the business to grow and which parts of the business to let demise, let's say, to let them shrink. And how do you handle people? Yeah. The people aspect. The, because the, 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 your yes, team will see you exactly. do uh, that. First, you want to keep everybody you got. That's your first priority. And I think you have to be seen to try that. But as you're trying to manage the business fast, it becomes clear in a, in a team that's close that some people are able to stand the, This is high pace uh, movement here. Um, and, some, and a few people will not be able to make the change. So the best thing you can do, and I try and do, is can we, at this people who have the right behaviors, not everybody has the right behaviors, um, that we can put in a new position and, and save, maintain the legacy knowledge. Uh, what's the important thing about someone who's been there 10 years? It's his experience, you don't want to lose that. Yeah. But at some point, uh, if, and I'm going to the extreme now, as I said, my experience has been that 85%, and I go into situations, maybe it's an American, uh, it's an American kind of uh, percentage, uh, but uh, uh, that people uh, get enthused about new ideas, eventually get there, and then you have to think about the 15%. The other thing you have to do is the issue of core capability, which I think is, uh, goes back to your question, Simeon. Reallocate, yes, I need to do something new, but do I know how to do it? And very frequently you find, if you are objective, there is no way on earth that your organization has the know-how, and I need to recruit that key person. Uh, and it could be expensive, but I, that's what I need to do to bring this new area of know-how and organize a new area. So uh, the 85% and the 15%, maybe you replace that 15% with that, that expertise you need, which is uh, key to the new thing you have to do. Uh, and bring the capability. There's nothing like people who know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> it's all about excellent people of high capability that enable performance. And at the end, it's not a democracy, like you said. It's not a, you're running a business, it's not a democracy, no. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a bureaucracy, it's not a democracy. Uh, it's not a theocracy because some CEOs think they're gods. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's certainly not a dictatorship. It's a benevolent dictatorship, maybe, but I think you need to, you know, you need to bring people in and enthuse them to, 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 you know, get in line, do extraordinary things. Extraordinary things get done by ordinary people. That's, I think that's a good objective. Another question, please. You and Dr. Krambis, you have been talking about disruptive forces and identification of the disruptive forces in advance. Um, this is, uh, of course, uh, related to innovation and disruptive force usually is related to something innovative coming up. In a company like yours, uh, will you go to extend your research, your R&D, in order to attack that disruptive force and uh, be able to compete with it? Or would you move for an acquisition of uh, mm -hmm. A company that has got the knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, in, I, I'll, ask, I'll answer it in, uh, in, in, in respect to disruption in technology, but in reality, in a, in a business like ours, uh, you see disruptors in your distribution system, uh, in, uh, in the global competition, you know, what's happening with China in the Far East. Um, so there are many disruptors. But in terms of technology, uh, in our area, frankly, we like to spend enough to be the disruptors ourselves. Uh, and also, we like to be, um, you know, the guys who cannibalize ourselves. So, um, oh. there's a lot of uh, industries that, um, let's say, you, you know, you can make this bottle for, uh, you know, one euro and a new technology comes that you can make it for 50 cents. But um, 
you know, you're the guy making it for one year and now you're going to have to take half the sales and maybe even half the profit because, you know, there's a new technology. So what do you do? The companies who lose stay with a one dollar bottle and the guy comes in and, uh, and takes them out of the market. We'd like to be the guys that cannibalize ourselves. We kill ourselves and go to the 50 cents first uh, because we don't want to leave uh, you know, we don't want to leave the space uh, for someone else. And if you don't do it to yourself, someone else is going to do it from, to you, whether from, it comes from Korea or China or the U.S. or Europe, I don't know. But, uh, so uh, you just got to be at the, at the edge of, uh, you know, at what is possible and in terms of value and technology. That's a great question. I think from all the, um, all the discussion, all the presentation you made, the most challenging um, requirement uh, need to have quality for management and for our organization it seems to be to be forward-looking to be able to uh, adapt before it's too late to react on time to be ready for change and so on um, this seems to be the most difficult thing because okay you you can do your detailed market analysis you know in-depth uh, workings of the competition and uh, where demand is going but all these things usually you can predict for a few months, maybe for a year maximum, and you have to plan ahead for two, three, four, five years in the future. So what does it take? Is it there some special analytical tools? It's vision? It's collective brainstorming? Or Yeah, yeah. I, 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 this is a very good question. Um, well, it takes everything you said <laughs> and, and, and then a bit more. Um, I think it's, it's an issue of uh, detailed forecasting isn't possible. I mean, the best thing I've heard about detailed forecasting was at a forecasting uh, conference once, and people said uh, the conclusion was forecasting is impossible, especially about the future. Having said that, <laughs> having said that um, I think trends uh, are really, uh, are, 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 uh, can be discerned. Can be, can be found out. Uh, for instance, something that appeals to me a lot is, you know, more for less. <laughs> more for less is a very good formula if you are in technology. In our case, we work in refining. If we can get more diesel and more gasoline, more petrol for every barrel of oil, well, it's a great, you know, you can't, you can't go wrong. So, um, uh, the other thing is growing markets, expanding populations. Look at what's happening in, in, in Asia now. If you look at the world 25 years ago, um, the, the, the so-called emerging world was, you know, 20% of the GDP, of the global GDP. Now it's 45, 50. Uh, in another 20 years, all the, um, you know, it's going to be a lot more. And you have enormous buying power. Uh, and big middle class coming. Uh, a lot of uh, the services we're going to be providing uh, and, and products are for those people. So there are these trends you can, you can follow. And the other thing is, don't make big bets. I think the people who lose are the people who uh, they kind of have a, uh, uh, you know, an epiphany on the road to Jerusalem, you know, and they, they just find that, ah, oh, this is the best thing and I have to put all my resources in it. Uh, and that's, that's a disaster. Uh, a little bit at a time, monitor over a year or two if it's a big move, uh, and you get there. Uh, but it's, you know, it's everything you said and then some, and then traveling a lot and listening a lot. I hope that addresses what you asked for. You identify the disruptive forces when you're close to the market. Yes, yes, and there's many types, it's not just from technology, uh, distribution. Uh, can be very disruptive. Uh, look at what um, you know now. Internet is doing disrupting all the retail. Twenty years ago, um, a lot of the guys that were in electronics, so they were not go going straight to the consumer. They had, they went through distribution chains. Those have disappeared. Um, the uh, competition from uh, from the east is is ferocious. It's closed down a lot of um, European, uh, southern European industry. Uh, and also a lot of American industry. So what do you do about that? How do you react to it? 
Um, so that's, uh, that's a disruptor, and it's, it's putting a lot of people out of work. And it has already done that. Uh, so which, you know, which side of that do you want to be at? So I think the disruptors are all over the place. And the more open the economies are, and Cyprus, one of the reasons Cyprus is having these problems is that it's in an open economy, which is a lot bigger than Cyprus. Uh, it's, it's a lot of guys can come at you at, uh, from a better base, and uh, you've got to find a way to get back at them. Um, How much time do you spend visiting customers? You said that 20% you run your company. Yeah. But the other 80%, how much? Uh, I probably spend 30 to 40% visiting uh, on the road or maybe visiting other companies, acquisitions. So I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of my office at least half the time. Um, and even in my office, I'll maybe do something for uh, having to do with something for the future, a new offering, a new plant, a new uh, something that is going to give us um, an advantage. Uh, so I'm, 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 I travel a lot. I like traveling a lot. Not, not because I think that's where the business is. I was on the lookout. Uh, yep. You just go to listen to what the customers say. Maybe we'll take another couple of questions. I know that uh, running a business is different from running a country. But it doesn't have to be very different. And listening to your presentation, I think that belief of mine has been reinforced. You've been around the world running various businesses, but also visiting many countries. Is there a country that you can identify that will have some lessons for Cyprus? I know the minister is here, so you have to be very candid. <laughs> well, this is some question. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I am a simple businessman. Um, so I want to stay away from politics. Um, I'm really having a lot of difficulty understanding uh, the politics. Um, and then, uh, Especially guess, Cyprus politics. Uh, well, Cyprus politics is difficult to understand. Uh, you know, where is the motivation? <laughs> is it the country? Is it the party? I don't understand why in a small place the parties are just fighting so hard. It's, uh, it's very difficult. And of course, um, the United States isn't far different either. Uh, so I think um, political paralysis is a, is a, is a problem, and uh, I hope the disease goes away. Um, and that's, I guess that's as far as I want to go. <laughs> um, but you do agree with the concept that the country should be run like a company? Uh, I, think, I think what we've lost, and I think I'm, I'm, uh, is... is what do you put first, the interest of the country or the interest of the party? And I think, I think that's, that's, that's been lost. And I hear a lot of politicians, and I, I won't refer to Cypriot politicians, uh, but I can certainly refer to a number of American politicians, um, that uh, they think their first objective is to win the next election. Okay, you say fine, and that justifies everything. The means, the end justifies the means. Uh, doing all sorts of things. I mean, we even had uh, one governor, I don't know if they made the news here, that uh, because he wasn't supported in, in his election by the other party, he stopped the traffic on the bridge, one of the biggest bridges in New York, to get revenge. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, it, this is just not a way to go forward, is it? And I think there's some of this, uh, and I read, I read the Cyprus newspapers, so internet is a wonderful thing. Uh, and there's some of the same disease here, and uh, it's not helpful. It really isn't. We have another question. Yes. Yes. Mr. Krambi, I think that in the case of the relationship between running a business and democracy, he has traversed the interesting Εκείνο που θα ήθελα να σας παρακαλέσω είναι αν μπορείτε να μας δώσετε δύο-τρία πρακτικά παραδείγματα το τι πρέπει να κάνουμε στην Κύπρο σε ό,τι αφορά την εφαρμογή της δημοκρατίας ή την μη εφαρμογή της δημοκρατίας στις επιχειρήσεις για να βελτιωθεί τελικά το κυπριακό επιχειρησιακό περιβάλλον. Mm. Well. Αν με επιτρέψετε να απαντήσω στα αγγλικά, διότι mm. δεν χρήσιμο επιβεβαιώνω τα ελληνικά πολύ συχνά. Ε, πρώτον, 
η ερώτησή σα είναι πολύ δύσκολη. Διότι δεν ξέρω τα δεδομένα τη Κύπρου καθημερινά για να μπορέσουμε να απαντήσουμε μια ανακρίβεια. However, let me just go in English. Uh, I think uh, a democracy is a great thing, and uh, you need a government. Uh, you need uh, basic rules. You need uh, people to, to put their rules in and, and the compliance. But it's when the government extends itself too much into the private sector uh, that things begin to go wrong. And the government has a big, uh, a big say on a big percentage of the economy. I think things go wrong. So, uh, you know, where you find the equilibrium on that, I think it's, uh, it's a, a question for every country to answer. I'm sure I haven't satisfied you, but, um, you know, that's as far okay. as I can go. Uh, can you give us an example from your experience where you had to cut back on something familiar to the company to expand in something? Where we cut back in one area and expanded in another? Yes, uh, very, uh, very, very much so. Um, uh, the previous company I was, uh, I was running was uh, an electronics company that was making electronic devices. And uh, uh, we um, really were on a wrong generation of technology, investing money on something that had no future. And other than the people in the business wouldn't see it because that's all they did all their lives. So they went in the morning, I make this, I make that, that's how I make it. They just wouldn't see that. Um, um, you know, the world had move, uh, moved on. So uh, I had to, what I had to do was see, was cut the expenditure, which means at the end of the day would mean people in areas that uh, just had no future and use that money for new technology. And that's a, thank you, that's a great example. I wish in your, at your age I would ask the same question. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, let's uh, just get yes. the uh, microphone. You wake up one day, you have a bad situation, and you find yourself the numbers are running you. So the solution is you reinvent the company. And your formula is that you're continuously reinventing the company so that in the future the bad situation will not affect you. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's a way of looking at it. I think uh, if you're continuously reinventing, you, you find you're not catching yourself out all the time. Mm -hmm. It's the guys who do not adjust over time, and then guess what? There is a huge adjustment, and then, um, which is, I think, what's happening to an extent in the economy here. It did not adapt over time, let its competitiveness get lost, and a lot of other things that happened. And uh, you have a, you're facing a precipice. Um, you do it gradually, dynamically, you win all the time, you're ahead of the problem. You're better to be in front of the problem than behind the problem. Right. Okay. So, dear friends, it was about a year ago, February last year, when we had our first uh, lecture with Larry Evans and uh, I was started thinking who the second lecture would be and at the same time I watched the news because that's what we do we watch the news and uh, we are on the lookout for companies like Honeywell because they are in our industry and at that time or about that time Honeywell recorded the highest ever share price in their history in what was still then a difficult economy. And I watched Dave Cote, the, the Honeywell Group CEO, in, uh, in an interview with, um, with Bloomberg, with Trish Reagan, the, in Bloomberg TV. And the one question, he was very happy, glowing. The price was over the roof. It was brilliant time, huge profits. And, uh, and Trish Regan asked him, so 
which is your favorite part of Honeywell? Which is the part that you really value? And he said, <clears throat> um, hard to choose one because they're all great, but if I had to really choose one, I would put performance materials and technologies. And the reason is that when we started with that, it was not doing that well. And there were even voices saying that we should kill it. And uh, we decided to focus on it, invest on it, and look where is it now. It's one of our stars. And uh, took that, and then I had a look on performance materials and technologies. And I saw who the CEO is. I had no idea. I didn't know. I had no idea. And then I said, yeah, this is what you have to do. So, Andrea, thank you for coming and being our second lecturer. It's honestly been an honor to have you here. Thank you very thank much. You very, very Thanks much. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. And and a big thank you to all of you who sacrificed an evening to sit here and listen to us, listen to Andreas and listen to this discussion.